political process to be deprioritized, be, be less important, uh, and and therefore, uh, and those spaces where uh, uh, fear, I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit to make a point uh, that they, they, those spaces were now given to uh, this sort of international NGO. And by the way, much of what I'm saying about international NGO can probably apply within the national space to national NGO, bigger national NGO, uh, different from social movements. So yes, I agree that uh, we need to reclaim some of those uh, way society was organized around occupation, around interest, around identity. So community for us in our uh, work now is not simply community of locality, but community of interest and identities, I think. Yes. Uh, what do you think should be the ideal relationship between INGOs and local NGOs, um, especially where INGOs seem to be in competition with local NGOs, and fairly, I think, because they come with bigger uh, reputations and capacity to mobilize resources? and don't often seem to complement in-country NGOs who need that uh, support from international NGOs to be able to do the work they're trying to do. And um, do you think they have a, a, a responsibility towards in-country NGOs? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, I was teaching just last week about this particular subject in a class. Uh, and the very uh, generalized answer to INGOs and NGOs are much more difficult to give because, as I said, the INGO envelopes have so many of them. The contractors to uh, faith-based to uh, small to big. So I think that it will differ quite a lot, the answer, but I'll give you... Uh, so we need to understand. So similarly, national NGO is also fraught with uh, its own different. There are bigger NGOs, which are bigger than some of the international NGOs. Uh, I know several NGOs in my country and many countries where I work, but national NGOs are bigger than international NGOs as well. The, uh, and uh, so there are dynamics within national NGOs, the smaller <coughs> NGOs, the smaller uh, national NGOs and bigger national NGOs also have the same tension as uh, bigger national NGOs and international NGOs. You see what I mean? So there is a layers and layers of relationship. On the whole, I feel that uh, international NGO should always work to make sure that the national NGO as a part of civil society grows, has a space, uh, uh, but the space is not finite. Uh, space is, um, I give an example, so should Oxfam and Accenture go and raise money in India now or not? If you go to there, the international uh, Indian NGOs are raising money, and as I said earlier, raising money is a way of mo a starting of mobilizing of citizens' action, yeah, middle class particularly in this case. So they are raising money, but inter inter Indian NGOs might say, well, you're competing with us. But actually, this is not a competition because you're not raising money. Indian NGOs can't raise money at the moment simply because it requires a lot more money to raise money, sadly. Uh, but also it requires time and skills, and it's not an agenda uh, of... So the space for raising money in India is very big at the moment and there is no competition. So sometimes space can be created by using and our logic and to a certain extent rationalization uh, is that, uh, that if, if we were able to raise money of Spam and Action Aid or World Vision or CARE, then Indian, the Indian giving will change, much more professional Indian people will give money to and eventually that money will also go to Indian NGO. Quite apart from the fact that all international, quite a number of international NGOs are also trying to be national or indigenized, if you like. Uh, but on the whole, the relationship between, unfortunately, relationship between international NGO as a sector in any given country that I know and national NGO is bad. At, at uh, best tense, at worst antagonistic which does not help either sector, unfortunately. Because many of the national NGOs actually are, have come to being with the help of international NGOs. It is very, I, whether, I mean, I, I don't know Zimbabwe, I can tell you South Africa, uh, Vietnam, uh, India, Nepal, many of them at one point or other uh, uh, had been funded, supported, trained, or even a staff moved from international NGO to national NGO to form national NGO. So there's no real need for this 
relationship. But international NGOs uh, don't care so much, sadly, because they are bigger and they, they will always find every international NGO will have 15 or 20 nas uh, national NGOs who they finance and they will be quite happy with them, each other, with their money involved. But the sectoral relationship, the bad sectoral relationship, is an unfortunate situation for which international NGO as those with bigger and more money should take responsibility, but also bigger international NGOs. John, I think, did, no, did, did you want to... Okay, if, if it was a question that follows up on this point, let's have well, it, I, and then I'll come to... I'll come back. You'll come back? Okay. Nicholas, uh, you would go oh, I, I wanted to discuss what you brought up about uh, the institutional aid of institutionalization of the aid society and also the evolution of large international NGOs. And I wanted to ask how you viewed their overall effectiveness if they remove themselves from um, like energizing their constituency by becoming more in tuned and allied or, or attached to the aid structure from governments and other large aid organizations, um, especially in the sense where if their mandate or mission evolves in the new era, they have somewhat of a contradictory sense. And you brought up MSF, Medicine Sans Frontier, or Doctors Without Borders, which is a good example because while providing health aid has always been their strongest suit and what they raise the most money for in a post-Cold War world, their advocacy agenda has grown and there's competition between criticism of <coughs> national governments where they're trying to work, but also in the inability of MSF to work with Western governments and mainly the drug industry on issues of TB, HIV, malaria medication, and issues of social justice within the drug trade. So I wanted to ask how you see these changes and evolutions, especially for large NGOs, um, affecting their overall ability to achieve their agenda. I think we'll have to go back to whatever, whichever NGO it is. What's the purpose? What's the mission? Uh, I'm not saying, I mean, we require all banks, yeah, those who deliver services only, but they shouldn't pretend that they will be able to change the structural uh, a structure of the society and the system and bring a sustainable change and they will deal with the symptoms uh, and some symptoms will disappear and therefore uh, it looks it will be fine but it will not be able to do a structural change so uh, I, I think we'll have to go back I believe that those uh, those organizations which actually want to build uh, citizens actions those who want to actually go for human rights and social justice uh, will have to find a certain level of independence from the power that they will be working against. Uh, and, and, and advocacy and campaigning is one of the ways of uh, bringing structural change, uh, addressing policies and practices uh, and addressing power relations and so on. So I believe that um, if that's the objective, if simply service delivery without objective, uh, just you actually build the schools and you deliver and you, that's, that's where you end. I believe that there will not be a structural change, that change will not be sustainable, and they are still needed. Maybe some people need to deliver services, some people need to do advocacy and they need to talk to each other. That's why a re new reconfiguration of roles, but what I am, I think increasingly, is that you can't do all the things. You cannot be the social enterprise and the service delivery and advocacy NGOs and a structural change in social justice in the same organizational form will be pretty hard. I think we should hold an international NGO accountable for that if they say it. Nicholas. In this same uh, discussion, I would like to know more about the relation uh, between larger NGOs and governments and how, how they could give uh, uh, sort um, of uh, help and support to strong institutions to have a, a sustainable change. And so uh, at the end, governments have a responsibility with some social issues. So uh, how this um, action from the NGOs could be not focusing their reaction and uh, could be more in the causes and help institutions to improve it. So I would like to, to see how is this relation and how uh, from the international perspective could be address this uh, situation in local, uh, in national government. The national government, I mean, as I said, these international NGOs are, have their, they, some of them even define home and not home. 
Uh, you're talking about a home country na government or any national government? A any national, national government. government. Okay. And then how is this uh, way that NGOs, international NGOs, affect international organizations and then they have an impact over the world? In, in local government? I think the, I, quite clearly in the last 10, 15 years the space has increased significantly because you know if you you can name as our staff in the USAID such and such committee and the uh, uh, UN's development cooperation forum even being in the drafting team food, uh, food strategy committee so international NGOs in, and some of the national NGOs have now occupy the space in many different places in the international arena much more much uh, clearly now I think uh, they, and but their impact varies considerably uh, but they are there and they influence they they are happy to be part of inter intergovernmental organizations particularly uh, the UN related uh, particularly in their own country where they feel that they have a responsibility to be part of they have a legitimacy to be part of uh, Organizations like World Bank and IMF, which are not democratic organizations, certain group of organizations will not go there to be part of that explicitly. Others will be quite happy to be part of that ex more explicitly and sit there in the committees and so on. So I think in the interna international arena, and that's where I feel that the, that's where they play, and they should be playing better, but the space is occupied. They have now started, they, their voices are heard, uh, and therefore they need to do more and better. In national, it varies considerably. Uh, in, in depending on the democratic space, uh, uh, you know, sometimes uh, you can get sucked into. I used to I say that one of our peer organizations in UK, when the Labour government was there, we didn't, you didn't know that there was any difference between this NGO and because their staff going in and out. Uh, you can see now in uh, DC. Uh, USAID people are so friendly with the international NGO people and the number uh, one of the vice president of the USAID is uh, just uh, one of the chief executives of uh, international NGO. So there is that in and out, sometimes can blur that because sometimes, you know, uh, that cozy relationship can look very too cozy. But I think we have to have all the tools in our from co cooperation to confrontation and we do that. I, I think we have uh, international NGO have less legitimacy to go and do that in India or somewhere, but we have been in the background and taken Indian governments to uh, court, Supreme Court, had a case against the British government in uh, Parliament uh, in the United Kingdom in, in relation to Sierra Leone. Uh, so I think we got to do uh, those relationships, are, but to do that you just need that much of uh, strong constituency as well. But it is increasing. It is much more difficult uh, in the countries where the democratic space is limited. And uh, during Bush's uh, eight years here, I think you should say, international NGO had given up advocacy in this country. Mm -hmm. They just didn't want to do anything, they didn't want to waste their time. Uh, and that was understandable in one hand because it just was totally uh, shut out, uh, as is the case in Canada just now. So uh, it changes. Chuck. So I guess what I'm thinking in terms of the bingos, um, how important is it in articulating and developing effective strategy in relationship to all these, some of these challenges, how to deal with the growth of philanthropic capitalism, how to de develop a more effective rights-based approach and so on. Um, the structure of the organizations themselves, both in terms of leadership and deliberative spaces, I mean, are these, um, in flux, are there ongoing conversations about, in order to develop a more effective way of encountering, let's say, philanthropic capitalism or the neoliberal project or whatever, we have to have at the table internally, not just stakeholders in a, on a table where we're one player, but internally uh, leaders who actually come from different kinds of origins and we have to have deliberative spaces where decision making is not limited to a particular self-perpetuating group, but that those pro oh, those spaces of deliberation are broader and more open. Are those conversations happening? It varies um, considerably. Um, I think uh, if I take a sort of more um, sectoral thing at the moment, the development organizations are the slowest to 
changed at the moment. Our, our, our don't seem 